kids are amazing. They're so happy and playful and excited and it was really something special and it was very heartwarming realizing the impact that we were having over there. Pause, before we can continue the video, we have a sponsorship I wanna tell you about. And the reason we have the sponsor on this video is I wanna take the money they give us and build more wells in the same place in the future. Because I know you think we have unlimited money, but we don't actually. And this will allow us to help tens of thousands of people. And having said that, Dragon City is a free to play mobile game available on iOS and Android. So for those of you who've only subscribed to me maybe over the last few months, you might not know of my reputation of the first person to ever try and cancel Mr. Beast. I did this over three years ago, talking about how his content exploited poverty. And then suddenly, year after year, more people realize that maybe this guy isn't as wholesome as he seems. But also, over three years, I've become increasingly jaded. And my zealous desire to cancel Mr. Beast has faded somewhat. And he already thought he was going to get cancelled for his latest video, where he builds 100 wells in Africa. Africa being the key word, which he likes to use a lot when describing African countries, even if it's a very specific one where one video is filmed, he'll still call it Africa, which we're going to discuss. And I didn't want to go after him in the way I usually do, because if you want that, go watch the other videos. But I kind of wanted to talk about this Mr. Beast in Africa thing in like a wider cultural context and part of a cultural analysis. And I'm going to nip a lot of the criticism of this video incoming in the bud in that I've watched the latest Mr. Beast video and in a complete vacuum, yes, it is very good what he did. You see in the video, he helps a lot of these communities with their water. He even builds a bridge for one of them. Amazing, right? We can all agree in a vacuum someone building wells and helping with the bridges is a good thing. So don't start writing in the comments that, oh my God, how could you criticize Mr. Beast? He is literally the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. But I kind of wanted to talk about Africa as a canvas for charity work, stereotypes around Africa, kind of stemming from like my own childhood. And I guess Mr. Beast has kind of never ever heard the conversation that white celebrity going to Africa has been outdated for a long time, but we're gonna talk about all of that today. Like I said, I've lost my desire to cancel this man, but at the same time, I do wanna talk about his video series in Africa. And there will be some fair criticism of Mr. Beast himself, and I'm not gonna pretend I like this guy, I don't. I think nearly everything he does is for clout. I think everything he does is for attention, money, Talks about wanting to be president one day and his platform seems so stupid. Yeah. Run for press? Yeah, I want to try to make a ton of money and then just like give it all away right before I announce my campaign. Like, <laughs> I thought you were going to say buy the president. <laughs> <laughs> no, like imagine make a ton I of bought money. the white <laughs> imagine, <laughs> yeah, yeah. imagine I have like $10 billion and then I just give it all away and I'm just like, I can't be bought. I had it all. Give it all away. Like, that's pretty powerful. So if I believe that he sincerely wants to be president one day and he does all these viral stunts, including charity work, is that maybe him working towards becoming like the president or something? Who knows? But yeah, follow me on social media at the Cavernacle on basically everything. Twitter is the main one, but also Instagram. And yeah, check out my Patreon. Trying to build up as many one to three dollar patrons as possible. Thanks for all the recent support lately. And this will also be like a nice break from like the Palestine coverage. I will make a video on something Palestine related uh, this week, and I will probably do a live stream about it as well. So. Look out for that. So um, let's first talk about like stereotypes of Africa and charity work. So I was born in 1995. So I don't remember like Live Aid, but I remember Live Aid. And I remember Make Poverty History. Do you remember that? It was basically these Western campaigns focused on Africa and was always talking about like tackling hunger, getting rid of malaria in Africa you know, solving all these issues with water as well. I remember that's a big one. And basically the propaganda you were fed in this like late 1990s, early 2000s optimism of solving all the issues in the world under globalized capitalism was basically, you would see loads of pictures of malnourished sub-Saharan African children, could be from Somalia, could be from Ethiopia, Kenya, could be from anywhere basically. There wasn't really any specific context given rather than black kids are hungry Black children don't have shoes, 
Black children don't go to school. Black children hike four hours every day to get their water allowance and stuff like that, right? That was the image you were shown throughout your childhood. And these campaigns like Make Poverty History were, of course, you know, in this neoliberal system, very, very vague. The problems weren't like neo-colonialism in sub-Saharan Africa, which is caused basically most of its problems, or capitalist extraction of sub-Saharan Africa, where all this charity work is focused. No, if you simply did loads more charity projects, you would fundamentally solve these problems. The side effect of these massive charity campaigns like Comic Relief, Make Poverty History, Live 8, is everyone just thinks Africa is just black Africans living in straw huts who drink dirty water. And I've literally had arguments with people that Africans have history beyond both living in rural villages and actually having massive historic civilizations that predate European colonialism. I'm not joking, it's a very popular view that Europeans brought civilization to sub-Saharan Africa. But funnily enough, um, a lot of people did get sick of this, especially figures in the black community in the UK, MPs, comedians, so just this little story from a couple years ago. Comic Relief will stop sending celebrities such as Ed Sheeran or Stacey Dooley to make promotional films in African countries after deciding the approach reinforces outdated stereotypes about white saviors. The anti-poverty charity best known for its Red Nose Day fundraising events has also said it will no longer portray the continent using images of starving people or critically ill children. Instead, it will highlight its work in African nations by promoting stories of ordinary life in the continent captured by local filmmakers and photographers. The decision follows growing criticism of Comic Relief's decades-long approach to fundraising, which often saw the charity send a white British celebrity to visit an African country before filming their emotional reaction at the conditions that they encountered and then asking the public for money. Comes after Labour MP David Lammy, who is a massive, massive sellout Zionist, but he has been okay on some things throughout his life. He said pictures of Stacey Dooley holding a young Ugandan boy on the show was perpetrating tired and unhelpful stereotypes. Sir Lenny Henry, one of Comic Relief's co-founders, told The Guardian it was time for a change. Diversity and inclusion is important both in front and behind the camera. Times have changed and society has evolved and we must evolve too. African people don't want us to tell their stories for them. What they need is more agency, a platform, and partnership. So why I present all of that to you before talking about Mr. Beast is that, yes, this is a conversation that has been going on for a long, long time. You know that song, Do They Know It's Christmas, is filled with these, like, old Western kind of racist stereotypes in Africa. Like, Africa doesn't have Christmas because there's, like, no snow, clean water, and poverty, right? It's a very old stereotype, and also... I always talk about this, Edward Said, obviously great man, and his book on Orientalism like encapsulates so much of this portrayal because although Orientalism focuses more on the traditional Orient, which was North Africa, the Middle East, and you know East Asia and stuff like that, stuff to do with Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, really relevant as well because if your only exposure to Sub-Saharan African countries is charity content about how poor they are how uneducated they are, how much they drink dirty water and stuff, and how like they're always involved in war and famine, then you basically think these people can't solve issues themselves because your knowledge of those countries is basically this stereotype of all of these people living in rural villages and having this life experience. And that's a criticism with, with Mr. Beast content as well because it's always slums or villages. Like, can he not just show something that Westerners can maybe relate to because so many people in Sub-Saharan Africa do live a very relatable life to the Western experience. Sure, there is insane poverty there. There are some of the poorest countries in the world. But when he goes to somewhere like Kenya, can he not contextualize it a bit more? Can he not go to Nairobi and show like a, maybe a city life we don't see in our media and maybe talk to the heads of the charities there? Contextualize stuff a bit more rather than here I am going to Africa, and look, it's literally the stuff you saw in 2005 with these white Western British celebs going to sub-Saharan Africa and doing the exact same stuff I did, right? So that's my broad criticism of all this stuff. Culturally, it just adds to unhelpful stereotypes, and of course you have the white saviour vibe. What goes with the white saviour vibe is these people cannot actually solve their own problems, so here I come to solve them for them, right? And of course, this type of stuff was also a justification for white colonialism throughout the world back in the day. 
Um, but now let's talk about Mr. Beast's like content on Africa. So he says the purpose of his content um, is to film good deed, inspire millions of kids to do good deed, use revenue from good deed to do next good deed, right? Seems noble, really. But then you got to ask, like, what is the message kids take away from these videos? Like, giving people water is good, right? Like, it's a very surface level morality. Mr. Beast is not very relatable in that he is very wealthy, biggest YouTuber in the world, very famous, also has a side charity to go with his channel, which is probably, you know, has a lot of tax write-offs involved. We can't do the same stuff as this, right? And I don't think it really inspires good because he doesn't contextualize any of the good he does. And I saw this tweet going around. It's basically saying, I wish Mr. Beast actually described why this was necessary. Like, why do I have to go here and make wells in Kenya, for example? Like, what is the political stagnation which means so many people don't have water? Or what's the, you know, the economic situation there? Or how do things like, you know, contribute to this? Mr. Beast could be like the biggest force for good if he only contextualized what he was doing. So people can see that, yes, politics and economics affect stuff like this, rather than putting this blank canvas out of basically Africa poor. And it's always poor and it always will be poor. So only me, Mr. Beast, can go and save it. So he tweets, built 100 worlds in Africa, go watch. I already know I'm going to get cancelled because I uploaded a video helping people. That's not why you get cancelled. To be 100% clear, I don't care. You definitely have always cared. I'm always going to use my channel to help people and try to inspire my audience to do the same. We spent over eight months working on tomorrow's video and it's the greatest thing I've ever done. So excited for you to watch. So here's the thumbnail. I built 100 wells in Africa. And I guess to be fair to him, in this video compared to his older ones, he is actually going to multiple countries in Africa. So calling it Africa, I don't think it's as bad as these other ones. So if you see on his other ones, and I've criticized these before, we built wells in Africa. And in this video, he's building wells in one country. So anyway, I'm gonna show you parts of the video. And like I said, I don't have any problem with what he's doing necessarily. Um, and it's a good thing for all these children involved. So let's have a little watch. You just witnessed a small village in Kenya get access to unlimited clean drinking water in less than a second. One down, 99 more wells in Africa to go. You're gonna love this video. Combined, these 100 wells are gonna give around half a million people fresh water to drink. How's it going? It's not expecting this. Thank you for the welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I need to <try> to react. <laughs> I appreciate it, everybody. This one of the teachers showed me where the students currently get their water, which is from this river. That's extremely unsafe to drink. This is where your students used to get water from? Yes. This is crazy. Yeah. You know, students complaining of diarrhea, infections like typhoid, because this is the water we've been using. So yeah. we try to treat, but you see, look at it. it you know, but at the end of the day, life has to move on. You have to get some water anyway. Oh, oh. <laughs> we flew out to the side of the 45th well, we realized this community had it even harder. Every time they need to get water, they need to take a treacherous mile-long hike through the jungle. And that mile-long hike also happens to be on a giant mountain. I wake up very early, about four o'clock, so that I can fetch water for the school. You guys would have to make this trip how many times a day? Two times. Two times a day. Oh, wow. So a typical student would carry something like this? Yeah. Oh, God. All of that just to get to the spigot. That water is still unsafe to drink. This is where you guys get your water from normally? Yeah. That would let them reach their well. We then traveled over 2,000 miles from Kenya to the country of Zimbabwe. We've been in Africa for over a week and we still have a lot more wells to do. Spending time in these villages really made me reflect on the importance of building wells, how it brings water to farms to feed the hungry, how it provides clean conditions for hospitals, and most importantly, how it helps the children of this next generation live long, healthy lives and build the future for all of these communities. We await a new dawn of clean drinking water. Water is life. And with some help from the locals, we finally finished a new bridge that this community can use for the next 100 years. Lives have been saved, families will come together, the worries will be gone. We're literally not profiting a dime off this video. 100% of the money we raise is going to go towards building more wells like you saw in this video all around the globe. I know it's weird that a YouTuber has to do all this stuff, but someone's got to do it. And if no one else is, we're going to do it. As you can tell, it really does change the lives of the communities where we build them. Okay, so Cynical cancelling Kavanaugh is coming back out for a little bit. 
Um, of course, this whole video just serves as a vehicle for how great Mr. Beast is because you have multiple instances of children thanking him, talking about how great he is, and this is something that's very common in these videos. Like, you know, I'm a cynical guy. I hope these children are just very happy and are chanting his name and haven't, you know, been told to do that for the camera. But as we've seen with recent controversy around Mr. Beast, these videos can be quite edited and manipulative, so I don't know about that. But anyway, also, you know, serves as a vehicle, and also, if I'm being very cynical, it acts like the problems of these communities are now gone. Like, they've got water now. Now they have a basic necessity that most of us in the Western world have, you know, don't even give a second thought to, and their lives are forever better. I mean, that is just how it's framed, right? And I'm very happy he's done this. I'm very happy for these children who don't have to walk so far to get just, you know, even contaminated water and all the diseases that spreads. He built that bridge. It's all very good, right? This charity work is all very good. He does say something at the end. He's like, you know, a YouTuber shouldn't have to do this, but here we are, and I'm going to do it. And like I said, I think the problem with these videos generally is there's just no context. And I think if he explains a bit more why Kenya, one of the examples there, or Zimbabwe, why they face these problems, it would help a lot more. And people often say to me, Mr. Beast's not a communist. What do you expect? And the thing is, I don't think you have to be overtly political about your own positions to contextualize these things a bit more, right? Because you have a country like Kenya and Zimbabwe, you're just throwing them into Africa. And a lot of people in both these countries don't have access to clean water, right? But these countries aren't even next to each other. The problems that face one are not the same problems as the other. In fact, you know, Zimbabwe and Kenya, if you know your history, literally dealing with complete opposite problems. Zimbabwe, of course, insane corruption, very authoritarian, had all the issues with Mugabe and his successors as well. Kenya is more like conventionally a democracy. It's actually a political issue in politics where different parties say they're going to solve it in different ways, either through, you know, national programs or privatization and stuff like that. So the context is like completely different, meaning the solution is completely different. And it seems like with Zimbabwe, the situation is more desperate than Kenya, because it seems like in Kenya, there is more of this political consciousness and it's more of a very important issue in their electoral politics. So I would say to Mr. Beast that like, if you just focused on Kenya, let's say make this video 15 minutes, go to Nairobi talk to like people involved in activism about the water issue and why there is such a problem with Kenyans having access to clean water, it just makes the video so much better because yes, you're doing the good thing as well. You're helping these people like doing really real world good for these people, but also you contextualize it. So then your audience, you say you want to inspire them to do good. Now they realize that there are certain parts of the world that just don't have this basic necessity as easy as the rest of us. And why is that? And then they will become informed on a country like Kenya and they won't just see Africa as rural villages where no one has clean water because that is the image that is painted in all these charity videos he's done in Africa so far. And as this is a vehicle for Mr. Beast's own brand, that's what makes you more cynical because he is obsessed with metrics, watch times, views, subs. Like genuinely he is obsessed, right? You can tell a lot of this has to do with his own narcissism towards his own brand and YouTube channel rather than a, you know, a genuine desire or a complete desire to do good. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't want to help people. I do think there's an ulterior motive that might actually, you know, exceed his desire to do good. And that is to become very famous and to maybe become president and to have people praise him because that's why he gets so mad when he gets criticism and doesn't understand it. So yeah, if I was to change this, I would say maybe make this a couple videos. They don't have to go up all at the same time. But if you spent a tiny bit longer, I think people like me would give you so much more goodwill and you'd be helping the world in more ways than just helping these individuals, right? Because you'd be helping to humanize sub-Saharan African countries a bit more, which I don't think these videos do. Because like I said, when I'm watching that, I'm thinking about all the stuff I watched on TV like 15, 20 years ago. It was the exact same thing. Poor black sub-Saharan African children, very happy to see a rich white celeb have to walk very far to get, you know, dirty water and stuff, and people telling me to donate to solve all these people's issues forever, right? And that's why I think some sort of political element to these videos, not overwhelming, but I think that would help. And then you have to ask yourselves, why Africa? Why not Asia? Why not America? I would ask Mr. Beast, why not America? Like you do some food bank stuff there. 
Lots of Americans do not have access to basic necessities. American poverty is really brutal in its own way. So why Africa? Because Africa is not controversial to a lot of people. Because like I said, the image we're fed of Africa is perpetual poverty. So going over there to help poor children get access to water, not controversial at all to most people, right? Because most people are fed this narrative about Africa. If he went to Palestine, like let's say before the war, if he went to West Bank now, tried to help with water and food, that is political, right? So he can't do that. If he went to somewhere like Haiti, maybe even, that would be political to Americans because the relationship between Haiti and America has always been pretty terrible. And even if he did it in America, then you have to start asking yourselves, well, why does he need to do this in America? Could it be the local politics? Could it be the federal politics? And if you want to make a brand where everyone likes you, just take yourselves out of that political environment and go to the apolitical countries of sub-Saharan Africa and go help some random village, right? Again, that is the cynic in me coming out, but I do believe that factors in. I really don't understand his obsession with Africa, to be honest, because I feel like everyone understood, like, the humanizing Africans through charity work is very tired at this point. It's probably just, you know, a lot of factors and how disengaged he is from just any political conversation. It's not like his crew are extremely diverse either, so he probably has no one telling him that, you know, you can make these videos better. That's all I'll say. If Mr. Beast ever watches this, I will say, you've done good work there. If you added five minutes to add some sort of cultural, political, economic context, and maybe humanize the actual country a bit more beyond rural village that we've seen a million times, I think that would go a long way. And hopefully, since you're like 24, 25, not that that's really an excuse because I'm only a tiny bit older, but maybe as you get older, you will realize that that is more helpful because just repackaging old kind of celebrity charity content from the 2000s for 2023, I don't think is revolutionary just because you're a YouTuber who films it and maybe, you know, sometimes even sticks a mobile game ad in the charity video about children not having access to clean water. And having said that, Dragon City is a free-to-play mobile game available on iOS and Android. Personally, I don't like Mr. Beast. I don't like his content. I don't like his charity content. Do I think he helps people? Sure, I do. Definitely. I've seen it on the videos. Apparently he does. Like, that's my take on Mr. Beast. Yeah, I don't personally like him. Don't like his content. I find a lot of it quite exploitative and some of it actually quite gross. This specific video, like, it's not offensive to me or anything, but at the same time, I think there's, like I said, ulterior motive there. I, I think his view of charity work as a means to, you know, solve everything is bad. I think his own white savior complex is problematic. A lot of Westerners have that. And I also think charity content exploiting poverty as a vehicle for your own brand like, personally, it's pretty gross, if I'm going to say that. But at the same time, on the ground reality, he helps a lot of people and he does generally good work. And like I've been saying throughout the video, if he contextualized this charity work, even in Africa, by the way, I think it would go down way better and it would be more effective because you are educating people too. As someone who makes a YouTube channel trying to educate people, that's the main thing I think we need to do because we're not going to change our world by just repackaging old stuff from, you know, the 1980s to the early 2000s, right? We need people to fundamentally reevaluate our economic systems, which, you know, put so many of us into terrible poverty. And in sub-Saharan Africa, even basic necessities are often hard to come by for people. But one more thing I wanted to talk about was just kind of, you know, finishing on all this. And this actually talks about Kenya as well, which is helpful. So um, from 2019, the problem is not negative Western media coverage of Africa, rather it is the lack of in-depth and nuanced reporting on the continent and beyond. And this is by Patrick Gaffera. So the New York Times is once again in Kenyan's crosshairs, just six months after it was excoriated for publishing graphic pictures of victims of the hotel attack in Nairobi, which forced it to shelve the appointments of Kamiko de Freitas Tamura as head of its Nairobi bureau, the search for a replacement has stirred up another hornet's nest in an ad for the position that appears to have been taken straight out of the late Binyavanga Wainaina's famous satirical essay, How to Write About Africa, the Times repeated many of the stereotypes that have dominated much of the reporting on the continent. The job, it proclaimed, would offer tremendous opportunity to dive into news 
and enterprise across a wide range of countries from the deserts of Sudan and the pirate seas of the Horn of Africa down through the forests of Congo and the shores of Tanzania, in addition to covering seemingly ubiquitous conflict and suffering, the successful candidate would also get to delight our readers with unexpected stories of hope in the region. Many Kenyans online have predictably responded with outrage. It says a lot about the kinds of stories they want from East Africa, tweeted Ken Opalo, who is an assistant professor at Georgetown University. He warned that the biggest losers from this sort of madness would not be Eastern Africans, but the daily Americans audience, who continue to be fed and believe myths, and as a result are increasingly economically and geopolitically uncompetitive in the region. The complaints about negative coverage in Western media are not new. Media negativity and its consequences have bemoaned the world over, but perhaps nowhere more than in Africa, where the prevailing perception is that a foreign media and Western correspondents in particular have gone out of their way to portray the continent as the nadir of human civilization, a dark continent of unspeakable tribal savageries, unmitigated suffering, horrible epidemics, and childlike helplessness, all bound by breathtaking vistas of natural beauty. And at the end it says, Rec recruiting local journalists who can explain rather than simply report, as well as improving the output of local media, can provide context for the horror stories the media gravitates to, making Africa seem less of, in the words of journalist Shayira Dark, a war-torn, disease-ridden, poverty-stricken hellscape where all hope dies. That article there, I think, is helpful in that, in that illustrating my problem with just general Western depictions of African countries, particularly in East Africa, but just all of Sub-Saharan Africa, is that they're often very, very dehumanizing, at like war and famine is just a natural part of actually just existing in Africa. Not that it is literally the continent that has suffered the most at the hands of European colonialism, but also neo-colonialism, very predatory from the West. And still today, we see all the issues in Congo. We've seen the historic issues in Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, seeing the issues in South Africa. That is caused by European colonialism and the legacy has not gone away. So perpetuating these stereotypes and not uplifting any like native voices just helps people to see this region as basically unsavable. Like there's nothing people can do to help these conditions apart from support Mr. Beast going over there creating wells, right? That's the only thing you can do as a Westerner. And it own and it takes a Westerner to cut through the corruption, cut through the warlords, cut through all the red tape these African countries design for themselves, because they don't really want to be helped, do they? And Mr. Beast will save them, right? Again, contextualizing why you're there is important, especially when you're making content that is so tired, that is so wrapped up in white savior tropes and everything. It's important to educate your global audience why you need to do this in the first place. And that can even be criticisms of the local government too, if you want. So yeah, that is my problem with Mr. Beast and his adventures in sub-Saharan Africa. Don't know why he focuses on Africa so much. Maybe he can diversify this a bit. There are plenty of poor places in the world. For some reason or another, if you are so focused on Africa, context would be a good thing. And you don't even have to frame it as like strictly political. Just speaking to activists who are trying to get water availability more on the agenda of the government and stuff, w wouldn't that be enough? I guess. Anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Again, too jaded to cancel Mr. Beast for real, but let me know what you guys think. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.